Good morning. Happy Wednesday. Praise God. Once again, he's given us another opportunity to walk this earth in faith, knowing that he is God and in control of everything that happens. Nothing happens that he does not allow. And he promises us that he works all things for good to those who love him. Thank you, dear God, for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to walk this earth with you, filled with your Holy Spirit, knowing that you care for us in a way that we will never comprehend. We cannot fully understand the love of God, but we acknowledge him for his love, and we thank him for his mercy and grace. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we come to you this morning joyful for the blessings that you bestow upon each and every life. You are a good God. There is none beside you. You are the one true creator of all that exists. And we exalt your name this morning. We pledge our allegiance to you, dear Father, and all we ask for this new day is that you lead and guide our lives in a way that brings glory to your name. Thank you, Father. Thank you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Today's daily devotional is titled, God praised for his greatness. It's in the book of First Chronicles, chapter 29, verses 11 through 13. And it says, Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come of thee, and thou reigneth over all. And in thine hand is power and might, and in thine hand it is to make great and to give strength unto all. Now, therefore, our God, we thank thee and praise thy glorious name. Amen. <clears throat> God is great. God is good. And we thank him. We thank him who he is because he's our salvation without him we're doomed so we give honor and praise to the work he's done on our behalf to sanctify and to keep us holy for his possession we belong to him and we should walk in his ways in his light. All right, section three, glorify the almighty. Warning to the wicked, Psalms 50, 16 through 21. But unto the wicked, God saith, what hath thou to do to declare my statutes or that thou should have take my covenant in thy mouth? Seeing thou hateth instruction, and casteth my words behind thee, when thou sawest a thief, then thou contendest with him, and have been partakers with adulterers. <clears throat> thou givest thou mouth to evil, 
and thy tongue frameth deceit. Thou sitteth and speaketh against thy brother. Thou slanderest thy own mom mother's son. These things hast thou done, and I kept silent. Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such as one as thyself. But I will reprove thee, and set them in order before thine eyes. The words of these verses are directed to the wicked, those who refuse to hear God's call to repentance. The wicked refuse to acknowledge their disobedience on God, or their dependence on God. God specifically addresses the hypocrites of the wicked, the hypocrisy of the wicked. How dare they speak of God's law or claim fidelity to his covenant? The words of God mean nothing to the wicked. God's first accusi accusation against them is that they hate instruction. This is a common accusation against the wicked and foolish in the Psalms and Proverbs. King Solomon wrote, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. And that's Proverbs 1, verse 7. The word instruction here refers to God's law, to turn our heart from the law leads to a life of wickedness and ultimate destruction. They that forsake the law praise the wicked. The wicked and foolish discard the words of the law as if they were irrelevant trash. The phrase, casteth my words behind thee, speaks to the total rejection of God. <clears throat> to reject God is the act of a fool. Psalms 14.1 The result of forgetting the law of God is people become complicit in thievery, adultery, and bearing false witness. Verse 21 says God had exercised extreme patience with his sinful people and withheld words of judgment. The people interrupted God's silence as divine ambulance at the least, ambivalence at the least, or at the worst as divine amorality. In other words, they have misunderstood God's patience for lack of concern for justice. See Malachi 2.17 and 3.14 and 15. They had come to believe God is as unprincipled as they were. But God's time of patience had come to an end. He would no longer remain silent. Centuries later, the Apostle Paul rebuked the Jews for hypocrisy and warned that their stubborn ways and unrepentant hearts were storing up wrath against themselves for the day of God's wrath. That's in Romans 2, 5. When God executes judgment, the wicked will cry out to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Revelation 6, 16-17 God's justice will prevail. Alright, there's an insert here titled, A Secret Atheist. It says, The hypocrite 
certainly is a secret atheist, where if he did not believe there was a God, he would not be so bold as to deceive him to his face. That was written by Thomas Adams. <clears throat> All right, section 3B, call to repentance. Psalms 50, verses 22 and 23. Now consider this. Ye that forget God, lest I tear you in pieces, and there be none to deliver, whoso offereth praise glorifieth me, and to him that ordereth his conversation aright will I show the salvation of God. God's threat of judgment is an expression of divine violence against the wicked. I will tear you apart. God is a merciless warrior against the wicked. The language reflects the imagery of a lion or bear devouring its prey. The wicked will find none who can deliver them from the wrath of God. The Apostle Paul asked, If God be for us, who can be against us? And that's in Romans 8.31. The psalmist warned, in essence, If God is against us, who can be for us? Only Yahweh is omnipotent. The gods of the ancient world were powerless to prevail against the people of God. Just as Yahweh's omnipotence ensures the righteous that he is all-powerful to save, his omnipotent warns the wicked that he is all-powerful to destroy. In Psalms 50:23, God again demonstrates mercy and patience in his rebuke of the wicked. God extends a call to repentance. Even though the people have forgotten God, he has, for not, he has not forgotten his people. God's words to Solomon remain pertinent in any age. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. And that's in Second Chronicles 7, 14. Oh, that is so powerful. God does not desire any to be destroyed because of sin. He's waiting patiently for you to turn to him and say, Father, I have sinned. I repent of that sin. I turn away and I want to walk in the direction that is the truth your path, not mine. Okay, the last word. Imagine a Sunday morning worship service in which the pastor does not preach a sermon. Instead, the pastor reads the words of Psalms 50 as the message to the congregation. The message declares God's word goes forth and he rules over all human affairs. We hear we will be called to account for how we respond to the words of God. Some in the congregation will hear prophetic words of promise and salvation. Others will hear, will hear a call to sanctification. Still others will respond in anger because their sinfulness has been called out. 
Some will rush to the altar to repent. Others will ignore God's warning of judgment and walk out the door. But in the end, God will have the last word. God's word will save those who hear, but it will judge those who refuse to hear. We don't like to think of the church as a place of judgment, but we should be reminded of Ananias and Sapphira who lied to the Holy Spirit and were struck dead. Also, Paul told the Corinthians some of them were weak and ill, while others had died because they ate the Lord's Supper without properly examining their lives. The point is, God will judge those who refuse to repent. Some will be judged in this age, but all will be judged in the age to come. Jesus declared, For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with the angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Oh my God. Jesus said that? That's in Matthew 16, 27. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Jesus is calling us to walk in obedience to the Father to work for his kingdom knowing that it's everlasting and the cares of this earth are temporal we have an opportunity to do work that will last for eternity spreading the gospel encouraging fellow Christians being a helpmate, being a testifier, giving testimony to the goodness of God, to draw men to Him so they might be saved. That's God's primary mission right now, is to save souls. And so please understand that you need to be an example that draws men to Christ, that allows them to see the truth of who God is. I thank you for your time this morning. I pray that you draw closer to God today, that you seek his face, repent of your sins, and ask him what the will for your life is. His will is true. And it's great. And you will be blessed when you follow the will of God, Father. Have a wonderful Wednesday, everyone. Praise God. He is so good.